Fact or fiction? Are they really that different? Beyond Belief. Fact or Fiction. Hosted by Jonathan Frakes. We live in a world where the real and the unreal live side by side, where substance is disguised as illusion and the only explanations are unexplainable. Can you separate truth from fantasy? To do so, you must break through the web of your experience and open your mind to things beyond belief. What you see is not always what you get. Take this line drawing of a man in profile. Is this an honest man? The answer is written across his face. During this program, you will be asked to distinguish truth from lies and stories that are designed to deceive you. We'll tell you which ones are inspired by actual events at the end of the show. From this point on, be careful what you choose to believe, because the man who seems to be telling the truth may actually turn out to be a liar. Innocent until proven guilty. Our entire system of criminal justice is based upon that premise. Yet in their zeal to see the guilty convicted, some are too willing to deny others that presumption. Craig Hoffman was that kind of cop. His philosophy was, if you're brought in, you must have done something wrong. Hoffman was determined to get a confession for every crime that passed his desk, no matter how many crimes he had to commit in the process. It was 5 p.m. on Tuesday when Sims was brought in again. It seemed like old times, except this time, the ending would be much different. Look who's back. Officer Sims, watch and learn. Help me out here, Sims. I want to talk about the armed robbery on the 45th last night. Now, you don't know anything about that, right? Well, you didn't have anything to do with it, did you? I mean, just because we picked you up a block from the scene mere minutes after it went down doesn't mean that uh, you had anything to do with it, right? And just because a witness picked you out of a lineup. Well, that doesn't mean that you're guilty of any crime, does it? Where's my lawyer? Oh, come on, Sims. We don't need a lawyer here. We're just talking. I mean, it's not like we think you were even involved, right, Sims? I mean, just because your rap sheet is a mile long, and just because you've been through the system so many times, they're about to name the revolving door after you. I mean, that doesn't even mean you were there. Go to hell. Officer Sands, readjust the restraints on the suspect, please. It's apparent that we need to have a more confidential conversation. Tell him what he wants to hear, even if you have to take it back later. Up yours. Don't mess with this guy. This isn't some good cop, bad cop routine. Officer Sands, hook him up and step out. Hey, Craig, uh, why don't you let me talk to him and see if I can... Get out. Confession is good for the soul. Just think of me as your priest. I'm not Catholic. And I didn't have anything to do with any holdup. Last chance. What are you going to do? Kiss me? Sure. Get ready to pucker up. Let's dance.
needs a doctor. Uh, let me confess this will get him one. Hey, McCarthy! McCarthy, get in here and help Sands take this piece of trash down on the lockup. Hey, Sims. Tell me when you're ready to talk. I didn't do it. This time it really wasn't me. The cops' business was done. Now it was up to maintenance to clean the wall. You can talk to me. Think of me as your priest. You know, confession is good for the soul. McCarthy! Yeah. Hey, that, that was supposed to be gone. How do you tell the cleaning crew I'm gonna start checking for green cards? They don't stop slacking off. They tried to clean it, but that stain won't come out. Then get it painted. Yes, sir. Now, where were we? Officer? It keeps bleeding through. Well, put some plaster on it. What, I gotta do your job as well as my own? Huh? Just get it done. Now, let me get this straight. The burnt spoons and the scales that we found in your apartment they're not yours, right? Hoffman! Sorry to break up your little party here, but we gotta take his pictures again. The film was bad. Uh, take him. Did you hear about Sims? What? The guy we had in here the other day, armed robbery. Oh, the guy with the uh, nosebleed, huh? Yeah. Well, it seems some crackhead in general lockup didn't like the way he looked at him. Bashed his head in. He's dead. Well, let's hear it for the crackhead. He did something the justice system could not. He stopped the revolving door. What happened next was reconstructed by investigators. Somehow, Hoffman found himself locked inside the room. And he must have been extremely frightened by something he saw. Because Craig Hoffman, an extremely fit police officer, experienced a fatal traumatic shock to his nervous system that night. <gasps> they found Hoffman's body in the morning. The official report said heart failure but nobody could explain the marks around his throat, as if he had been strangled by hand. Weeks later, another man confessed to the armed robbery, clearing the name of Sims. The bloody handprint never appeared again. What's the true explanation here? Was the handprint on the wall really a message from an innocent man? Or was it an illusion caused by some defect in workmanship found in the wall itself? If so, why did it reappear after the wall was plastered over? And what about the strange death of Craig Hoffman? If it was a heart attack, why did his neck show signs of strangulation? Did he accidentally strangle himself as he was trying to gasp for air? Or was it some retribution from beyond? Is this story true, or are the handprints of a writer all over it? Find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, Screams Haunt a Schoolroom on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Is there a more annoying sound than the screech of chalk against chalkboard? We all remember teachers who, despite years of classroom experience, couldn't stop from making that sound, and students who would make the sound just to annoy the rest of the class. But there is something highly unusual about the chalkboard in our story tonight. 
The sounds it emits are far more intense than the usual annoying squeaks. In fact, they are sounds that seem to come from the depths of hell itself. Mama Kisser, huh? Did you hear the wrong note in choir? I was an honor student. I couldn't believe I actually had to stay after school in detention. It was a strange place to be, but not nearly as strange as the events that would take place later. So what is it, Mama's boy? I faked the note to skip gym, okay? My, you're a real desperado. <laughs> Maybe everyone doesn't aspire to your level of criminal mind. Oh, really? Well, I do. What about you, girlfriend? Why are you hanging with us nasty boys? Ooh. I'm good in math. I let a friend copy answers on my test. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, that's cool, Claire. Well, this is our good friend, Mr. Mumbles. Man, oh. <laughs> yo, yo. Hey, Mr. Mumbles! Hey! Hey, you! Don't you know he's a deaf mute? Hey, Mr. Mumbles! That's not funny. What? I didn't do anything. Come on, Molly, man. That's how we got in here in the first place, man. Sit down, leave that man alone. Hey, hey, what do you say there? You said you're harmless, but I say you give failure a bad name. Ha! Time never seemed to pass as slowly as it did that afternoon. I was bored out of my mind, but looking back on it, maybe boredom wasn't such a bad thing. This school sucks! You're gonna get us all in a lot of trouble when Mrs. Sawyer comes back. Okay. Oh my god. What was that? Hey, man. Ain't coming from out there, man. And where's all that screaming coming from? I don't know. Draw another line. What are you, a nut? Just do it. Oh, man, that's coming from the blackboard. OK, this is impossible. What the hell's going on? Someone's in trouble, and they're calling for help. How do we know where this person is at? Give me the chalk. <sighs> we follow the screams. Maybe one of us should stay behind and wait for Mrs. Sawyer to come back. Yeah. Good. You stay here. Just keep drawing on the board. Come on, you guys. What are you waiting for? So we started following the trail of screams, hoping it would lead us to the source. We didn't know why this was happening. We just knew it was. Okay, that's it. I promise I'll never cut Jim again. This way. It's hard to tell. Yeah, it's coming from that way. You're right. Uh, you go first, though. It's locked. Uh, Step aside. Come on, hurry! All right, I got it. Why 
Where's it coming from? Okay, so nothing. Over there! Where? Look out! Come on, help me over here! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh. Hurry up! Oh slide him out! Slide him out! Yeah, he's gonna be all right. Get him out the smoke. Oh gosh. Oh, yeah. Yes. Careful, careful. It's all right. Look, it's okay. Watch out for this hole. Okay, easy. Okay. All right. Over there. The door. Settle down. Easy, easy. Come easy. on, man. Easy. Uh, easy. Uh, uh, uh. You all right, bro? You can't understand me, huh? What's he saying? He'd like to thank you both. Man, it's all right. It's all right. Hey, as long as you are. I'm sorry. Okay. Could the story be true? Could the sounds of a man in distress really be communicated through the chalkboard? Or did the students just imagine the board was transmitting those sounds? Were the sounds actually coming from the vents around the building? But then, the janitor's vocal cords were in no shape to make any sounds in the first place. To figure out whether this story is fact or fiction isn't an easy exercise. But that's your assignment. Find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a trip to the woods takes an unexpected turn on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. How many reports have you watched and read about the dangers of stress? Stressful, aren't they? Fighting stress has become a major industry. Squeeze this, rub this, listen to this. All designed to help you unwind and reduce a condition that has been blamed for everything from high blood pressure to hiccups. Diane Lerner was feeling the major symptoms of stress in her life. She was determined to shake off its effects and find a place where she could relax and enjoy the world again. But is there such a place? Diana's about to find out. Hey, Ross, it's me. Diane Lerner was taking her first time off since she started at her company. And on the way up, she spent most of the time on the phone to the office. It's outstanding. Driving. Um, on my desk, I've got this... It'll wait till you get back, Diane. No, no, it won't. I want you to... You're on your first vacation in two years. Chill out, Diane. Listen. I worked up some new numbers for dramas. Now, when you check out the spreadsheet, I want you to look at line number 30. Diane, we're not going to fall apart here. At least not totally. I promise I'm not going to give that account to anyone else. Don't worry. Throw the phone away. Goodbye. Ross, Ross, don't hang up. I'm serious. Look, just do those few things for me, and I really I appreciate it, okay? Bye, I'll Diane. get back to you later. You too. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs> Safe driving was not Diane Lerner's strong point, but somehow she appeared at her dream getaway right on time. <laughs> the woodland cabin was just as she pictured it. The key was left just where the landlady promised, and the view was just the remedy Diane needed for the tension that she'd been feeling lately. The inside of the cabin had the smell of hickory and pine wood, and the furnishings were perfect. If Diane was looking for peace and quiet, this forest setting was the place. In fact, it was so quiet, it was almost spooky. Oh, oh God. I, I didn't expect someone to be here. I'm Mrs. James. Oh, right, of course. I, I spoke to you on the phone earlier. Yes. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, I'm so sorry. I see I've frightened you. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm a bit unnerved. I, I, what? I almost got into a car accident on my way here. I had dropped something and there, there was this huge boulder that was jutting out right into the road and I turned and, well, 
I almost didn't make it here for my vacation. I'm glad you made it in one piece. <laughs> I was just tidying up. This place has been closed up for some time. Oh, it's great. I mean, look at this. It's, it's even more beautiful than you described. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. I think you're going to be very comfortable and cozy here. Oh, I know I am. <laughs> I just, I've got a lot of work to do, and I just needed some place that I could really concentrate. On your vacation. Oh, okay. Well, the bedrooms and the bath are upstairs. There's the kitchen. And uh, you probably passed Osgood's store on the way a few miles back? Oh, yeah. Mm. Now, they make their own ice cream. You've got to get the pistachio <laughs> while you're there. <laughs> so I, I think I'll leave you alone so you can work. Great. Uh, where's the closest neighbor? Oh, that would be me. If you cut straight through the woods, I'm about a mile due east. So look, I've left my number by the phone. If you need anything, call. Otherwise, I'll just check with you in a few days. Mm, thank and I'll, you. I'll leave the local paper on your porch. And I think that just about covers it. Well, thank you. So enjoy. OK. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. It was early the next morning when Diane started hearing the voices. She ignored the sounds at first, thinking it must have been the wind through the trees. But then they came back again. James, you know the children that live in this area? There aren't any children living in this area, not for miles. In fact, the people who live close by have children who've grown up and moved out of the house. Really? Well, there was a bunch of kids playing around in the yard and you know, making a lot of noise. Really? You sure? Mm hmm Are you really okay, my dear? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm fine. I just, I just have to finish up this work, that's all. Anyway, I don't think they're going to come back. Thanks for calling, Mrs. James. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, I thought I told you kids not to play around here anymore, OK? That's enough. Hey, I'm not kidding. Why do you persist on playing this game? I want you all to go home now. No. Come now. Hey, I'm not joking anymore. I want each and every one of you to go home. Go on, get out of here. It's time. Go away. Come with us. <sighs> the peace and quiet of the forest was forever disturbed now. The next day, she would feel differently about it. Or what? You know. No, no, I don't. It's time. Time for what? What, this?
Let's look at the paper again. Another accident the same day involving six schoolchildren. Was the woman that Mrs. James encountered that day only the spirit of Diane Lerner? Did she truly become one of the spirits of the woods? Did she join the ghosts of the children who died in the bus tragedy? Or was our witness, Mrs. James, a bit overexcitable? Maybe she imagined that Diane disappeared. Could it be that Diane was disappointed with her paradise and slipped out without telling Mrs. James? But what then are we to make of the newspaper article? Is the truth easy to spot here? Or is it difficult to tell the forest from the trees? Find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, fate visits a corner drugstore on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. For those of us who grew up in another generation, the corner drugstore was a magical place. You gave the man behind the counter an illegible note from your doctor and he would fill tiny bottles with pills and potions that had the power to make you feel better. And perhaps most magical of all, the man knew you by name. Everett Spencer was a throwback to that earlier time when the pharmacy profession was a personal one. But now the modern era is starting to close in on him like, like a virus and he has no prescription to fight it off. Everett Spencer was always a hero to his grandson. That's why he became a pharmacist too. In the old days, Everett was quick, sharp, on top of all the latest breakthroughs, but nowadays he was slow and set in his ways. Just post the prescription on the board and type out the label. The new junior partner, his grandson, Martin, was going to change all that. There we are, Granddad. The family business. How about that? I couldn't be more proud. The first customer that day was a steady patron of the pharmacy since Martin was a little boy. Ruth, how are you doing this morning? Doing just fine, Everett. Do you remember my grandson, Martin? Oh, of course. <laughs> Martin is a pharmacist, too. He's going to be working with me. It's nice to see you, Mrs. Fulton. Thank you. Martin, could you snag Ms. Fulton's prescription off the shelf? Sure. It must be wonderful having your grandson back here again and working with you, too. It's a proud day. Uh, Granddad? <laughs> yes, that's it. Uh, there's no drug indicated. Yes, we know what it's for, don't we, Ruth? <laughs> now, can I get you anything else today? No, no, no. This will keep me going. See you in a couple okay. of weeks. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Granddad, what were those pills? Oh, Ruth's been taking those for the better part of 20 years. Well, there was no drug name. I mean, what if she forgets and she starts mixing prescriptions? I mean, you should indicate what they are, unless they're sugar pills. That's right. Why are you giving her pills that have no medicinal purpose? Because she thinks they do. Okay, Granddad, it's time we step into the 21st century. The only people who are prescribed placebos anymore are... Sometimes people like Mrs. Fulton. Anyway, she swears by them. You heard her. They keep her going. Oh, Grandpa, you're still typing labels with that old typewriter? Everyone's computerized now. Everyone but me. I have no need to learn something so complicated. It's easy, Grandpa. I could teach you it would triple our business. Doctors could email us directly. We would finally be able to compete with the chain pharmacies. But I enjoy my relationships with people. I like talking to the doctors. Well, now you can talk to the doctors about your golf game and not prescriptions. You're not gonna convince me that technology is more important than human relations. Be right with you. It's me, Grandpa. Here it is, our link to the 21st century. I know, I know you're not happy about it, but this one is so easy, Grandpa. Everything we need is already loaded. We just plug it in. I got it all set up. Now, with this bundle of wires, you can go on an African safari. I'm too old for a safari. Well, not if you could do it in the comfort of your own chair. Set this baby up. I've got to mail these letters. Mrs. Samuels will be in to pick up her medication. It's 10 milligrams of Ephesus. The prescription is right here. I'll put it on the board. Dr. S.L. Hampton. Yes. Yeah, I called his office yesterday. I gave them a new email address. 
I'll bet they emailed that prescription. I'll be right back. I'll take care of Mrs. Samuels. Martin could tell that his grandfather was upset, but he felt that in time, he would thank him for all this. I'll be right there. Martin would never forget this customer, not after what happened that day. Hi, can I help you? Yes, I'm picking up a prescription. Harriet Samuels. Oh, yes, Mrs. Samuels. It'll be just a few minutes. Martin went to the board where Everett had posted Mrs. Samuels' prescription. But the prescription was I'm gone. I'm in somewhat of a hurry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Hampton, 10 milligrams of Equisite. I was just about to fill it. Is there a problem? No, ma'am. No, um, I just... I just need to reconfirm the prescription on our new computer system. We're linked up with Dr. Hampton's office, so this should just take a second. This was the first test of Martin's system, the high-tech approach. But for some reason, the prescription wasn't coming up. As I said, I'm in a hurry. Yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll be right with you. Hello, Mrs. Samuels. Oh, hello, Everett. Perhaps you can help. I'm in a hurry, and I think there might be a problem with my prescription. I'll take care of it right away. I'm sorry for the delay. Thank you, Everett. Do you have the prescription? It's not on the board. I couldn't find it. Did you call the doctor? Well, I was trying to get it on the computer first. I mean, I know that you said it was 10 milligrams of Acroset, but... Carolyn, it's Everett Spencer. I've misplaced the prescription for Harriet Samuels. Uh, can I have a minute with S.L.? S.L., I'm sorry to bother you. I, I've managed to misplace the prescription on Harriet Samuels. I know it's for Equiset, 10 milligrams, but I... One milligram? Oh, uh, oh, thank goodness I called you. Sure, sure. Goodbye. Oh, my God, Grandpa. 10 milligrams would have killed her. I'm sure it said 10 milligrams. We'll be right with you, Mrs. Samuels. Would you fill it for me, please? At that point, Everett walked over to check the board again. Martin? I thought you said it wasn't here. Who was watching over Spencewick Pharmacy that day? Was that fated prescription simply misplaced? If so, how did it end up back on the board? Did Everett's grandson find it and put it back himself, too embarrassed to tell his grandfather what really happened? But then, how did it disappear in the first place? Maybe there was some angelic spirit watching over the pharmacy. Does this strange story of a prescription go down easy? Or do you find it hard to swallow? Find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a scary story of summer camp on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. For most of us, summer camp evokes sweet thoughts of fresh air, fun in the sun, and mischief after dark. But for some children, summer camp recalls more bitter feelings. Memories of isolation, homesickness, and the taunts of their peers all Anthony Shaw wanted to do was have a happy, carefree summer away. Everyone knew he was different. They were about to find out he was special. I never really wanted to go away to camp. All I really did there was read, and I could have done that staying at home. I actually liked the rainy days the best because they gave us free time, and I could lose myself in a book. I really didn't give anybody any trouble. I just wanted to be left alone. I couldn't figure out why the other kids wouldn't allow that to happen. Especially Marty and Darren. Don't be a jerk, okay? It's me. Keep your hands off me. I need your help. Will you help me? With what? I need to find Darren. I can't find him anywhere. Marty, I'm getting tired. We've been looking for over an hour. I know, I know. I'm getting hungry, too. 
At least the rain quit a little bit. Did you hear that? Yeah. I'll, I'll check the back tent. You check the storage tent. Well, who was screaming? It sounded like someone was getting murdered. Yeah! yeah! Anthony, go to your tent. You two clowns, come with me. Sit down. Is there something seriously wrong with you guys? It was a joke. He got hurt. Anthony did. Now, I want you guys to lay off him. But this was totally red. You should have seen him. Man, he almost put his... Knock it off. Now, he's a nice kid who's having a hard time. Try, try to have a little bit of compassion, okay? I mean, how would you feel if someone did something like that to you? No one does. Such a wimp. And stop calling him names. You understand me? Yeah, whatever. Marty? Okay. Jeez. Gotta get us something to eat. Gotta get us something to eat. Hey, watch this, watch this. Anthony, wake up. <laughs> Anthony. Hey, they say the rain should be letting up. Let's get dressed and moving. Richard, look at Anthony. I think there's something definitely wrong. Hey, Anthony. We're going canoeing today. Your favorite. Get up. Where's Marty and Darren? Did they do this to him? I, I don't know. I haven't seen him all morning. I didn't see him either. His pulse is racing. You okay? A nightmare. It was weird. You know how sometimes in your dreams you do something and you don't know why? I dreamt that I got out of bed and went running and running through the woods. All I knew was somebody was in trouble and I was the only one who could help them. We're not gonna get caught. Everyone will just sleep where we left. Come on. That's a wolf. That's a hungry, hungry wolf. <laughs> help, help, no! Nice. Lay down. Come on, the wolf. Nice. Oh, help. Guys, shh. Here we'll keep we'll feet. Anthony never left the tent. That's the cookies. It's the ones he fed the wolf. So what kind of a dream was that anyway? How could Anthony have been asleep in his bunk and outside in the woods at the same time? 
that if it was in his bunk the whole time, that who saved Marty and Darren from the wolf? Did Marty and Darren in their terror only imagine that Anthony was there? But what about the detail of the chocolate chip cookies? Could they have imagined that too? Is this a story of a person being in two places at once, or is it just another tale one would tell around the fire at summer camp? Next, you'll find out which of our stories are fact and which are fiction when Beyond Belief returns. And now it's time to see how well you did judging whether our stories tonight were fact or fiction. The plot about the detective who couldn't remove the stain from his wall or his conscience. Real or unreal? Tell him what he wants to hear, even if you have to take it back later. Up yours. Don't mess with this guy. This isn't some good cop, bad cop routine. Officer Sands, hook him up and step out. Hey, Craig, uh, why don't you let me talk to him and see if I can... Get out. If you guessed this one was based on an actual event, you're right. It happened. How about the tale of the terrifying sound that seemed to come from a common classroom chalkboard? True or false? Okay, that's it. I promise I'll never cut Jim again. This way. The story of a school haunted by the sounds of screams was inspired by actual events. It's fact. Our next story was about the woman who left her high-stress job for a heaven on earth. Are you listening to me at all? Did this story of the Garden of Angels ring true to you? Not this time. We created it. What about the story of the vanishing prescription? Did you think this one was based on reality? I've managed to misplace the prescription on Harriet Samuels. I know it's for Equiseth, 10 milligrams, but I... One milligram? Oh, uh, oh, thank goodness I called you. Sure, sure. Goodbye. Oh, my God, Grandpa. Like 10 milligrams would have killed her. This tale of a mysterious force protecting a pharmacy is based on an actual incident. It's real. A story that took place at summer camp of a boy that seemed to be in two places at once. Fact or fiction? Go down the hill slowly behind me. Don't run or he'll chase you. He never even growled at me or anything. He just kept staring at me. Was this a figment of a writer's imagination? No. This one was inspired by truth. So what was your score tonight? Were you able to separate fact from fantasy? And how bizarre does reality have to become before it reaches a point that's beyond belief? I'm Jonathan Frakes. Join us for more stories next time on Beyond Belief.